This is Philosophy Bites with me, David Edmonds. And me, Nigel Warburton. Philosophy Bites is available at www.philosophybites.com. We all know what maths is. We can roughly agree on the demarcation of history, or science, geography, French, or classics. But philosophy? What is the definition of philosophy? What are its limits? One man is very well placed to answer that question. Edward Craig is the retired Knightbridge Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge University and the editor of a colossal ten-volume encyclopaedia of philosophy. Perhaps unsurprisingly, he thinks philosophy has in the past been far too narrowly defined. Edward Craig, welcome to Philosophy Bites. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Nigel. And today what I want to ask you about is the question, what is philosophy? The question, what is philosophy, is a philosophical question, it strikes me. It certainly is, and uh, I think my approach to it is that maybe we shouldn't be asking the question quite like that. When people are asked to define philosophy, they will often say something very narrow indeed, to, I think, the great detriment of the subject. I think it's better to think in terms of there being a huge range of interesting questions. Then along come various specialised disciplines, for instance... Once the investigation of nature requires the experimental method, and in particular when it requires mathematics, then we start to think of it as natural science. Here's an idea. Let's just drop the word philosophical as an adjective that comes before words like thought or question or theory. Right? Let's just drop it. If a thought's worth thinking about, then it's worth thinking about. And whether it's a philosophical thought or not, then just drops away. As, 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 as irrelevant. The question is, is it worth thinking about? If it's worth thinking about, then is it best thought about by people who are in some kind of specialist discipline requiring specialised training, e.g. in mathematics and the experimental method? If it is, then once disciplines have to be divided, then it becomes part of the natural sciences. There's also a rough and ready distinction we make between some things being philosophy and its being religion. And that comes, doesn't it, roughly at the point where certain ways of thinking become connected with certain established rituals, roughly. Though if you forget about the rituals and liturgical forms, I would be more than happy to say that religious thought is philosophical thought. You've given a a kind of descriptive Mm. definition or account of what philosophy is, Mm. whereas most philosophers who approach the question, what is philosophy, will give you an evaluative answer about what is good philosophy, really. They think, well, there are lots of things called philosophy, but I'm going to tell you what good philosophy is. Yes. And I wonder if you want to say something about what, in your view, good philosophy is, the kind of narrower category. I suppose I think that good philosophy is philosophy that's right. And uh, my own conception of what's right turns out actually to be a highly sceptical one. Good philosophy in that sense is the sort of philosophy that is constantly asking people for reasons for what they say and examining their arguments. That doesn't pick out any particular school, obviously. Of course, you also have to remember that the types of reason and the types of argument that people can bring to bear can be of very different kinds, can't they? For one thing, you can have the type of reason that's brought to bear when people are arguing quite directly for some conclusion someone um, comes up with uh, what's frankly probably a rather as miserable and traditional little object which is called a proof of the existence of God, right? Where they're arguing directly for a particular conclusion. But then you can also have people, Nietzsche's the obvious example who comes to mind, people who, as it were, stand at one remove from all this and try to, uh, as it were, not join the debate but explain the debate in his case, largely in psychological terms. Um, There you've got two very different examples of how you might approach a certain subject matter, both of which can be treated in in the rational argumentative way and evaluated. I suppose I think that that's what philosophy um, should really be like because I think that if it's not conducted in that way then we're just hearing nothing but the personal preferences of whoever's talking and personal preferences are here today and gone tomorrow as is the preferrer. 
You've been a professional philosopher for a number of years and you've now retired from that. Looking back at what you did, mm. do you think there is a special value attached to committing yourself to a job as a philosopher or is philosophy perhaps open to everybody at some level? Both, I think. I certainly think philosophy is open to everybody at some level, rather in the sense that oxygen is open to everybody at some level, because nearly everyone's got some kind of set of values, and very many people, in addition, have what you might sort of call some embryonic metaphysical views. Is there a god? Do we have a spiritual bit that survives bodily death, or is it that we're just very complicated physical objects that fall to bits when we die? If you've got views of that kind, then you've got philosophical views that if you're going to put an academic label on them are, I suppose, metaphysics. And most of us have also got epistemological views. How do you know that, mate? Right? Um, uh, bec because I saw it. Right? Because the priest said so because it's on the internet, because a scientist told me, because I've done the experiment. So everyone's got views about how, in particular cases, you ought to set about getting reliable beliefs. So, in a way, we've all got a bit of ethics, we've all got a bit of metaphysics, and we've all got a bit of epistemology. So philosophy is something that we're in. Not necessarily philosophy as the process of thought. It's one of these words, isn't it, that can denote both the process of thinking and the result and in the sense of the result we've all got a, a substantial amount of philosophy it's not as if it were something that that one can avoid or not being concerned with though you can of course avoid thinking about it but when i'm doing philosophy when i'm philosophizing yeah. does that have a value in itself whether or not i arrive at a coherent philosophy well it's an experience of a certain aspect of human life I mean, I would be quite put out if someone told me that my attempts to play the piano had no value because I'm never going to bring them to the level of a polished performance. In a way, maybe, this is, this is something similar. If you enjoy doing it, it's got a value. If you don't enjoy doing it, it's still got a value because at least you may find out something about the difficulties of coming to a, a settled and satisfactory view on whatever it is you're thinking about. Learning an instrument, for me, actually helps me appreciate just how subtle and brilliant some of the great performers and composers of the past have been because what sounds simple yes. is incredibly it's difficult nice. to achieve or maybe requires such a balance of different sorts of skills that I can really, through attempting it myself, discover something that I wouldn't otherwise have access to. Yes, yes. Well, I, I, think, I think that's very well put, very well put. Something s similar is the case, you go in for sport, you, you come to appreciate what's actually involved in doing it well then perhaps you don't throw so many beer bottles at the opposition's goalkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine um, two people having an argument in, in a pub about whether God exists or not. Mm -hmm. What's different about that from the kind of activity that you've done you know, as a professor of philosophy in the Cambridge Philosophy Department? Well, I think maybe not as much as you might think, except that I and my colleagues discuss these issues with a far greater degree of self-awareness. What we're saying, what kind of arguments we're using, what has been said about these things in the past. In a way, you can go back to the, um, the musical analogy. What am I doing? I'm playing the piano. What is Alfred Brendel doing? Well, he's playing the piano too. We're both doing the same thing. He's doing a bit better than I am. He's got far greater control of his fingers. He's got a far more coherent conception of what he's trying to do with the entire piece. He knows just what are the differences between the way he does it and the way some other great pianist does it. And he's prepared to tell you why he does it his way. The level of self-awareness at, at, let us say, the Moral Sciences Club, if I can refer to that famous institution is extremely high. Altogether different levels of expertise and concentration are required. And of course there's also the point that should the guy in the dog and duck say something that's that's really sharp and original, it's likely to pass in the dog and duck for just something else he's said. 
the level of appreciation of the quality of the discussion, both for better and for worse, is entirely different. Some of what you've been saying seems to imply that almost any kind of thought can be philosophy. I wonder why, when you've got such a a broad conception of philosophy, you get put into a philosophy department rather than somewhere else. If it's an autobiographical question, then I got into philosophy and hence into a philosophy department because the questions that are asked and the way the questions are asked in a very, very narrow conception of philosophy particularly appealed to me. That is, I think, the autobiographical answer. If it's a a rather different sort of question about which faculty should someone be in if they are a philosopher, well, the answer is certainly not necessarily that they should be in a philosophy department. They may very well be in a history department. They may very well be in economics and politics. They might be in classics. Some people, after all, whom we think of as experts in the philosophy of modern physics are not a million miles removed from being theoretical physicists. They come with PhDs in physics and then they start doing what we call the philosophy of 20th century physics. You can have attachments all over the place and be a philosopher. I mean, of course, within philosophy departments, you're actually encouraged to spend the whole of your time in the kind of pursuit that we're engaged in now. Whereas uh, if you're in a history department, I suppose you better spend some of the time uh, looking in libraries and reading old documents and actually doing some history. Otherwise, people will say you ought to be in the philosophy faculty, and they'd probably be right. But it's not, I think, that there is any one discipline which simply has a monopoly on this kind of thought. And of course, I wouldn't think that because one of the things I'm urging is that we should take a very, very relaxed and elastic and flexible and accommodating view over the expression, this kind of thought. On that note, thank you very much, Trevor Craig, for a really interesting discussion, which certainly has made me reflect on what I do as a philosopher. Thank you, Nigel, for giving me the opportunity. I'm uh, I'm quite interested to hear the result and uh, find out a little bit about what I think of these issues. And you can hear more Philosophy Bites at www.philosophybites.com. Mm-hmm.